I suppose that if there is any section in the prophecy of Ezekiel that is familiar, it's now these two chapters that we're going to look at, chapters 38 and 39. Now, I'm going to attempt to handle them just a little bit differently than we generally do, because I'm anxious here to lift out certain great truths for us. And I think that that will probably be the best way to get a hold of the truth that is here. Now, these two chapters, unfortunately, have been interpreted by men who apparently have no knowledge of the prophecy of Ezekiel and what goes with it. And as a result, they come up with some of the oddest interpretations of it that I think I've ever heard. And therefore, that's the reason we're dealing with this as we are. In this connection, I always think of the advertisement that was put in the Minds magazine over in El Paso, Texas, by a few fellows over there. They were mining experts and engineers, and they published an ad in that paper over there, and they published it as has been said, deadpan, as if it's very serious. Will you listen to this? Wanted man to work on nuclear, fissionable, isotope, molecular, reactive counters, and three-phase cyclotronic uranium photosynthesizers. No experience necessary. And may I say to you, I feel about these two chapters as I do about this ad. It's rather humorous, unless you've studied all of Ezekiel, to come to this chapter. Now, we saw in the last chapter that God has a purpose for the nation Israel, and he has a very definite purpose for the nation Israel in the future. And in connection with that, these two chapters go because they tell about the last enemy that will come down against them in the last days. And we can, of course, take that over there of the Valley of the Dead Bones, and we can certainly make an application of it. This world that you and I live in today is a death valley, dead bones, dead people, if you please. Oh, they talk about that they are alive and that they are really the ones where the action is, but they're dead in trespasses and sins and no spiritual life. And that's the reason that they have to have a drink or two or take a dope or they've got to do something to liven up the old corpse, you see. Now, God has made it very clear. He that hath the Son hath life. And he that hath not the Son hath not life. That is, he's dead. And there are two kinds of people, live people and dead people. Or as we say in Los Angeles, the quick and the dead. And if you're not quick here, you're going to be dead because of the traffic condition. But he also says in John 3:36, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. But he that believeth not the Son hath not life, but the wrath of God abideth in him. That means he's dead. Now, God is saying to you today, if you're not a Christian, he's saying, O oh, ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. You can come alive. It has that application. But let's be sure we're talking about the nation Israel. Now, I believe in chapters 38 and 39, the enemy that's mentioned here is Russia. I want to also add that when I entered the ministry, I did not believe that it referred to Russia. I refused to accept that interpretation. I had been to a seminary that taught amillennialism, my denominational seminary, and I would not accept it. And even after I worked for my doctor's degree, I did not accept it, even at the time of my graduation. But I came to the conclusion I better study this on my own. And I have come up with this interpretation, and there are three points of contact that make me know in my own heart and mind that we're talking about Russia. You have here what is known as the linguistic phenomenon. You have the second, the geographical phenomenon, and the philosophical phenomenon.
Now you have, first of all here, what we call the linguistic phenomenon. And that is the thing I think that's rather important to note. We want to read now the first three verses. The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against Gog of the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him. Now, we have here, actually, this man Gog, and I understand that's a Tartaric word that means roof. That means the man's on top. And I can't think of a better name for a dictator than Gog, the fellow that's on top. And if he's not on top, he's not a dictator. And if he's on top, he is a dictator. Now, I have here Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him. Now, you'll notice that we've made here the translation that's in our authorized version. Now, this word chief here, actually, it should be changed because it really means a head, and the Hebrew word is rosh, and it was the learned Dean Stanley, whose exhaustive history of the Eastern Church it was published half a century ago, And in that was a note by Gesenius, the great Hebrew scholar, to the effect that the word rus, or rosh, as we have it here, the Hebrew is rosh, that it, in this passage of Scripture here, should be Russia. And then Dean Stanley adds this, and this is something important to note, that this is the only reference that you have to a modern nation in the entire Old Testament. This is the only one that is referred to a modern nation, and that is the nation of Russia. Now, Bishop Lothar, he made the statement that Rosh, taken as a proper name in Ezekiel, signifies the inhabitants of Scythia, from whom the modern Russians derive their name. You see, Russia was first called Muscovy, and it's a name derived from Meshach. And it was Ivan the Fourth, and that was the ruler, the Tsar of Russia, who was called Ivan the Terrible. And he came to the Muscovite throne in 1533, and he assumed the title of Tsar of Russia. And that was the first time that this name was used. And I'm sure you can note that the words of Meshach and Tubal, they certainly sound like Moscow and also Tobolsh, way over in Siberia. I believe that here you have something quite remarkable. And I can't see that when you look at the language that you could come up with anything except this, that we're talking about the modern nation of Russia. Now, the second proof that I think we have is the geographical phenomenon. And twice here, it's mentioned of the north. And we have here the different ones that are going to be with Russia in that day. Gomer, that's Germany, and all its hordes, the house of Togarma, that's Turkey of the north quarters. And there you have it, north quarters. And then in verse 15, thou shalt come from thy place out of the north parts. And then in chapter 39, verse 2, I will turn thee back and leave but the sixth part of thee, and I will cause thee to come up from the north parts and will bring thee upon the mountains of Israel. Now, this place is identified for us as the north part, you see. And you get a map. When I give an illustrated message on this passage in Scripture, I always show a map of Israel and Russia. And the literal of it, very frankly here, it means the uttermost parts of the north. Now, you get a map, and Russia is northwest, north, and directly north, and northeast. In fact, it just covers it like that picture that you've seen of the fella that's under a great big sombrero. I take it he is a Mexican, but it doesn't say that. And he's leaning up against a cat. I have a notion the reason his hat covers his entire face so you can't see him 
is you don't want to hear what he says when he backs up on that cactus. But there he is, and he's supposed to be enjoying a siesta. I don't see how he could do it, leaning that. But that hat covers him just like Russia covers the nation Israel, and it's from the north. Now, north in the Bible does not mean north of Los Angeles or north of where you live. In the Bible, north is north of the land of Israel. South is south of the land of Israel. West is west of the land of Israel. And east is east of the land of Israel. In other words, it is the geographical center as far as the Word of God is concerned. Now we come to the philosophical reason that we believe. And that, I think, is one of the great proofs. And this is remarkable here. And he says here in verse 3, "...and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal." Now, this is strange language. God now in Ezekiel has said it several times, as we've seen. He has said it against Babylon. He said it against Egypt. He said it against these nations that were against his people and that actually were against God. And here is a nation now that arises in the last days, and it is against God. And we know it's against God because God says, I'm against you. Now, the strange thing about this that makes it different from any other nation, God said it about certain nations that were already in existence because of their great enmity and rejection of God. But this nation hasn't even come into existence when Ezekiel gave this, and yet God says he's against it. Now, that's strange, and I'll tell you why. I think it's strange. Have you ever noted that you and I have seen something that no generation in the past has seen? That is, a nation whose basic philosophy is atheism. The political economy of the nation rests upon the premise, there is no God. It's atheistic. Now, no other nation of the past ever appeared quite like that with such a dominant position as to say there is no God. Now, somebody says, what about the heathen pagan nations of the past? None of them, friends, were atheistic. They were polytheistic. You see, in the beginning, when men went off the track, they didn't become atheists. The reason they didn't become atheists is, I think, very easy to understand. They're too close to the mooring mass of revelation. After all, in Noah's day, you didn't have atheists. That wasn't the problem with that crowd at all. The problem with them was that they'd gone off into sin, and they worshiped many gods. Man went off at that point. He was polytheistic. All the great nations of the past were... And these judgments that God has given, he said of Memphis, all the idols would disappear, and they have disappeared. Probably no people so given over to idolatry with the exception of the Babylonians. But that was the thing that characterized the ancient world. But here is a nation whose basic philosophy is they're against God, atheistic. You see, at the beginning, no atheists. God never gave a commandment against atheism at the beginning. You don't have it. For instance, he did give the first two commandments against polytheism. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. That is the first commandment. The second one, thou shalt not make unto thee any likeness of anything, heaven above, earth beneath. So that you have here commandments against polytheism, none against atheism. Now, when you come to the time of David, atheism is beginning to appear. And David said, the fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. Now, that word fool is even worse than the word fool. It means really insane. It means a man that's not in his right mind. It means that it's a man that doesn't have a full deck, a man that's lost some of his marble, that he has something loose up there in the belfry. That's the individual, and that's the mark of atheism. I had a friend that had a wonderful ministry among atheists. God wonderfully used him with these people. And he, on one occasion, heard a man say, I don't believe there's a God, and I think when we die, we're just like a dog, and that ends it all. 
This friend of mine waited till everybody left. He didn't want to embarrass the man. When everybody had left, he said to the man, Did I rightly understand you that you do not believe that there's a God? He said, That's right. He said, Then you claim to be an atheist? He said, I am an atheist. Well, now he says, I have a question to ask you. He says, The Bible says that the fool hath said in his heart there is no God, and that word fool is insane. Now, were you serious when you said there is no God? Or are you insane? Must be one of the two, and I'd just like to know which one it is. That rather shook the individual. May I say to you, that's what the Word of God said. And I think that we got quite a few that are running around today that somebody ought to get the butterfly net and put on them as they deny the existence of God. That is almost an untenable position for a little man. But now here is a nation that has arisen, and that has been its basic philosophy. And as a result, it's been a nation that men in high places have said, you can't negotiate with these people. Mr. Churchill said of Russia, a riddle wrapped in a mystery inside an enigma. That's Russia. And then it was Rube Goldberg who drew one of these crazy cartoons years ago, and he called it the great upside-down philosopher, and he was speaking of Joe Stalin, and underneath he had this, top is bottom, black is white, far is near, and day is night, big is little, high is low, cold is hot, and yes is no. Unreasonable, insane, if you please. But that's been the basic philosophy of this nation, and it's risen in our day. Now, God already beat them to the draw before they turned against God. And they did. Mr. Stalin said, We have deposed the czars of the earth, and we shall now dethrone the Lord of heaven. And I could give quotation after quotation, but when they put a rocket past the moon, the Sputnik, you remember, in orbit, and then they put the rocket out, and as it was nearing the sun, they went on the radio in Russia, Our rocket has bypassed the moon. It's nearing the sun. We've not discovered God. We've turned out lights in heaven that no man will be able to put on again. We're breaking the yoke of the gospel, the opium of the masses. Let us go forth, and Christ shall be relegated to mythology. Now, I've often wondered what they had in mind. Did they think God was playing peek-a-boo on the other side of the moon? And because they got a glimpse of the other side of the moon, they didn't see God, that somehow or another he doesn't exist. May I say to you, that is the upside-down philosopher. Now, here you have these three points of identification. And when you get to the 39th chapter, God repeats it again that he's against them. Now, why will they come down into the land of Israel? Well, God says he's going to bring them down there. Verse 4, God says, I will turn thee back. I'll put hooks into thy jaws, and I'll bring thee forth in all thine army. God says, I'm going to put hooks in your jaws, and I'm going to bring you down into that land whether you like it or not. Now, that has been interpreted that God, when they came down to that land, that he'd lead them out of that land. He'd draw them out, but that's not what he says, because he makes it very clear that he intends to judge them in that land and that they're not going to come out of it. He's not going to use a hook to bring them out of that land. Over in verse 11 of chapter 39, it says, "...it shall come to pass in that day." that I will give unto Gog a place there of graves in Israel. Now, if he's going to bury them in Israel, obviously he's not going to lead them out of Israel. And he makes it very clear that this is going to be a slaughter, the like of which has not been seen probably in the history of the world. And this is something, therefore, that causes us to go back and What does he mean? He puts hooks into their jaws, and I'll bring thee forth. Well, what he means and what obviously he's saying is, I'm bringing you down into that land, and God says, I'm going to put hooks in your jaws and bring you down into that land. Now, this is a land, therefore, that Israel will be back in at that time. 
Now, for years, that land was not occupied by them. To tell the truth, after Titus had destroyed that land, why, these people were sold into slavery throughout the world, and they were scattered throughout the world. And the land was not a land of milk and honey. We have seen in the book of Ezekiel that even the Negev down there was covered with forest. God said he was going to burn that out. He did. At least there are no trees down there today. And that's the place where this man Elijah went and left his servant, and he kept going on out into the desert, crawled up and under a juniper tree. Well, if Elijah was there today, he'd have trouble finding a juniper tree to crawl up and under. He'd have to find something else. Mark Twain said concerning that land, and I'm quoting him now, "...Palestine sits in sackcloth and ashes, desolate and unlovely. It's a hopeless, dreary, heartbroken land." And why should it be otherwise? Can the curse of the deity beautify a land? Palestine is no more of this workday world. It is sacred to poetry and tradition. It's dreamland. Now, it was Dr. Theodore Herzl. He was a playwright in Austria. And he is the man that began this tremendous Zionist movement back to that land. And he made this statement, "...there's a land without a people." There's a people without a land. Give the land without a people to the people without a land. And so Dr. Wiseman, who was the first president of Israel, he was speaking before the Anglo-American Commission of Inquiry. He says, "...the Jewish nation is a ghost nation. Only the God of Israel has kept the Jewish people alive." And Mr. David Ben-Gurion, the premier for many years of that Jewish state, and listen to him. He said, Ezekiel 37 has been fulfilled, and the nation of Israel is hearing the footsteps of the Messiah. Well, they've turned from that now, because I have a picture taken when they had their 21st anniversary, I think it was, and there was a great motto in the auditorium there at Tel Aviv, and it was in English and also in Hebrew, and it says, science will bring peace to this land. Well, I thought that the Bible said in the Old Testament that the Messiah would bring peace to the land. So apparently they're chasing a new Messiah today. Now, I believe that today we can already see three hooks that God has that he could use to bring them down into that land. Now, number one is this. They're looking for a warm water port, a place for ships. And Russia is moving in this direction. I sat years ago in the dining room on the top floor of the Hilton Hotel in Istanbul and watched Russian ships coming out of the Black Sea, moving through the Bosphorus, and headed for the Mediterranean Sea. And that was something that took place after the time that they had the Six-Day War. And after that war, the Russian naval strength increased 40%. And what are they looking for? They're looking for a warm water port. They're moving south. And today, they have a tremendous fleet. And the Admiral Sergei Gorshkov, he's made this statement, and I'm quoting him now. The flag of the Soviet Navy now proudly flies over the oceans of the world. Sooner or later, the United States will have to understand that it no longer has mastery of the seas. They're looking for a warm water port. Where are they going? Well, all I know is, they're going where they're going, and they're headed for the Mediterranean. And what nation along the east side of the Mediterranean would be the one that would be suitable? be the nation Israel. And today, they're very much interested in moving southward. God has put a hook in the jaw. Now, there is a second hook God has there, and that is oil. 
Today we are being reminded that the world is running short of energy, oil being one of the chemicals that we're running short on. And as a result, the world is turning to where the oil is. The oil is in the Near East. And whether it's in Israel or not is actually not the important thing. The important thing is that a great deal of that oil, in spite of the strained relations between the Arabs and Israel, is coming through that land. And that makes it quite amazing because the ships not being able to get through the Suez Canal put it off at a port that Israel has taken, and then it is pumped across the land of Israel, and it is brought out in Ashdod being one place. And, of course, in Haifa that was cut off after the Six-Day War, so that the oil becomes something the world's interested in. As far back as 1955, I brought a message that Russia was hungering for the Arabian oil, that they wanted it. And an editor of a paper in downtown Los Angeles came up to hear the message. He disagreed with it. After that, he made a trip over, and I have here his article, a copy of it, and he said, Russia hungers for Arabian oil. Changed his viewpoint after he'd been over there. Now, the oil reserves go something like this. And I got this from a man that is in research, and he's close to the oil industry, that the total oil reserves in the earth today are estimated at 300 billion barrels. And we're using 6,400,000,000 barrels a year. And that Russia's oil reserves are 11,200,000,000 barrels. And the United States has 35 billion barrels in oil reserves. But in the Middle East, the oil reserves amount to 167 billion barrels. Well, there's over three times as much oil there as the United States and Russia combined have. Apparently, that's a pretty good hook God's got in the jaws because any modern nation today is going to have to have oil. And that's where it is today. Now, the third hook we'd like to mention is the Dead Sea. In the Dead Sea, there is untold wealth in chemicals that are in saturation in the water there. And it's also a place where men are looking today. It's estimated that the Dead Sea contains 2 billion tons of potassium chloride, which is potash. And it's certainly needed today to sweeten up and enrich the soil that's being depleted in many areas, including our own. And that's only one. There's 22 billion tons of magnesium chloride. And then there is 6 billion tons of calcium chloride. And there are others, cesium, cobalt, manganese, are there as well, actually, as gold. And believe me, friends, that effort is being made today to get it out. Now, if you had been around oh, a few million years ago, and you would have seen the Lord forming this earth and fixing this place there, the Dead Sea, you would probably have asked him, what are you doing there, damming up that sea? Well, you're going to have a pretty salty place. Oh, he would have said, I'm baiting a hook. And you would have said, baiting a hook for what? He said, well, there's going to be coming down here in a few million years a nation up north, and I'm going to bring them down. <laughs> so I'm just baiting my hook now a little ahead of time. And that's what God's been doing. He's been baiting a hook. Now, they're coming down. Well, the question is, when are they coming down? Well, here is where so many expositors disagree. There are some that believe that at the end of this age, that is where we are today, before the church leaves, they'll come down. There are others that believe that he'll come down at the beginning of the Great Tribulation, others at the end. And there are some believe that he'll come down at the beginning of the millennium. 
Now, I'm not going into these different viewpoints. The only thing that I want to say today is that my particular viewpoint is that it comes down in the latter days. And these latter days, as we've seen in the other prophets, and it becomes a technical term, it specifically refers to the Great Tribulation period. Now, I won't go into detail now about this, but when Antichrist comes to power, he's going to come to power on a peace platform. He's going to promise peace, prosperity, and everything that the world wants today. And as a result, why, there will be a false peace. In the midst of that tribulation period of seven years, there will be a peace, the first part. Then Russia will come down from the north. And I believe this is it. Notice verse 8. After many days thou shalt be visited in the latter years. Thou shalt come into the land that is brought back from the sword, and it's gathered out of many peoples against the mountains of Israel, which have been always waste, but it's brought forth out of the nations, and they shall dwell safely, all of them. Now, here again is what I believe is something that's quite remarkable. It was actually right after World War II, Lord Beverly was visiting General Douglas MacArthur at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel in New York City. And the reporters were there and wanted to have a press conference, but both of these men refused. The reporters waited downstairs. After two or three hours, Lord Beverly came down, and he did answer a few questions, and one of them had to do with Russia, of course, at that time. And everybody was saying, Russia is going to move, take East Berlin, and it'll make a move into Europe. And Lord Beverly said, I do not believe that Russia will move to the West. I believe that Russia will move to the South. And General MacArthur agrees with me in that. That was an interesting statement. And about that same time, and it's been repeated many times since then, the only place where there's a real honest-to-goodness crisis is in the Middle East. And friends, after men have forgotten all about Vietnam, they're going to know about the nation Israel. It's been in the headlines now for many, many centuries. They're going to come down into that land. Russia will come down into the land of Israel. Now, what will the result be? In chapter 39, verse 2, I read, And I will turn thee back and leave but the sixth part of thee, and will cause thee to come up from the north parts. Now, where it says, I'll leave but a sixth part of thee, the literal is, I will six thee. Or, better still, I will send a pestilence, or six plagues upon you. Now, what are they? Well, back in verse 22 of chapter 38, God says, I will enter into judgment against him. And here the six are pestilence, blood, and then we have here an overflowing rain, and then great hailstones, the fourth, and then fire is five, and then brimstone is six. Now, those are the judgments. Now, why did God ever give to us the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah? Just to let you and me know how he's going to judge these people. How did he destroy Sodom and Gomorrah? Well, he did it with brimstone, we're told, that they rained upon the city hail and fire and brimstone. And that's exactly the way God intends to destroy this army that will be coming out of the north against his people to destroy them. And you must remember that Russia has always been anti-Semitic from the very beginning. And today, I suppose outside of the land of Israel in this country, the largest number of Jews are yonder in Russia. And they're having a problem today of getting them out. Now, they will come down. God says that they will. This is the way that he'll destroy them. Now, that has a message for me and I want to say it rather hurriedly, but I want to say it this. When God was ready to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, Abraham thought God was being unjust. And he said, if there are 50, 40, 30, 20, or there are 10 people there, why didn't he come on down to one? 
because he thought Lot absolutely was not God's child, but he was. And did you know that God said to Lot, you get out of this city. I can't destroy it as long as you are here. I do not believe God will or can let the tribulation come till he gets his church out of the world, and that's the picture. And here we are given that information. This is a tremendous passage of Scripture, friends. You know, people don't read Ezekiel much these days, do they? Now, let me put it very bluntly and very briefly. All hell will break loose on the earth during that period. It's a frightful, terrible period. And I just don't quite understand these folk that are saying that God's redeemed. The church will go through this period when everything makes it clear that they'll not go through it at all and that those witnessing on the earth are the 144,000 of Israel. And this book of Ezekiel makes it very clear. He's only talking about nations of the world and the nation Israel. Now, God having dealt in judgment with this enemy that has come down into the land, and he brought them down, and now he judges them, then we find the rest of that period, Antichrist becomes the world ruler. And then the Lord Jesus Christ comes to the earth to establish his kingdom here upon the earth. And you have that picture in the 19th chapter of the book of Revelation. And then the 20th chapter of the kingdom, the thousand years, begins. Now, I'd like very much to conclude this judgment section of Ezekiel. Now, I'm going to do something I very seldom do on this program, is to read something to you. I have jotted down here some notes that I want to follow. Now, ordinarily, I teach in an extemporaneous manner, as many of you have discovered. That's been our method. We feel like it's the best. I guess I started off wrong. I preach from notes, but taught without notes in an extemporaneous way. That has it backwards, they tell me, but that's the way I felt led to do it. And the reason I used notes for preaching was because we were on radio and I only had a certain amount of time, and I had to say it in a hurry, so I needed the notes before me. Now, I'm not writing this in any manner or means in flowering verbiage. I'm not using clever cliches. And I'm not attempting to get pearl-sounding words. What we are attempting now is to see something that is here in these prophets. Now I'm reading. We have now examined rather carefully three of the four major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. Certain great principles emerge which the fourth prophet that's Daniel, he'll confirm these great truths. Now, these great principles have an ageless application for nations of the world and for believers. And when I say believers, I'd use the term Christians, but that is assumed to mean church members. I'm speaking about those who have trusted the Lord Jesus who believe this is the Word of God. Now, we have here... God's dealings with Israel, but just a microcosm of the world in which we live. So that when we're looking here at God's dealings with Israel, and that's the interpretation, Israel here means Israel. I don't know why that there's some man, when they turn to the map in the back of their Bible and see Israel, they say, well, that's a land, that's real. But when they turn to Ezekiel and read Israel, that means a church. Now, how you can do a flip like that on the flying trapeze of theology is beyond me. But some are pretty good at doing it, by the way. Now, will you notice, these principles that we see here that God used in dealing with his own people, these principles are eternal, for they are linked to the character and the attributes of God. Now, we have stated some of them in both Isaiah and Jeremiah. And now we are prepared to draw certain conclusions from Ezekiel. And now will you follow me rather carefully? No prophet emphasizes the glory 
and the holiness of God more than Ezekiel. He saw the glory of God. That was that great vision at the beginning. He never got away from that. And we need to recognize that and also not get away from it. Now, his emphasis, therefore, is upon the judgment of God, as we've said. And I'm sure many of you, when we went through that section again and again, God long-suffering, not willing that any should perish, again and again would warn them to turn to God. He would judge Jerusalem. Chapter after chapter, he said that. Now, the emphasis was upon the judgment of God. Now, when that came, then he offered them encouragement as he looked into the future. But he said, another enemy is coming. And the Lord Jesus, when he was here, wept over Jerusalem because he knew that Titus the Roman would be around in a few years and destroy the city just as Nebuchadnezzar had done and as it will be done in the future. And that's yet to come. Now, the thing that's important here is that there were things that were wrong in Jerusalem. And if that city was to enjoy the blessings of God, those things must be made right. The liars should cease lying. The thieves should cease stealing. The lawless should become law-abiding. And righteousness would prevail and should prevail in the city, and only then could they have the blessing of God when God was acknowledged and respected in the land. Now, that is true, and righteousness must prevail before an individual or any nation can experience the love, the mercy, and the goodness of God. And the very interesting thing is that Jerusalem was wrong. They were thinking wrong. They were acting wrong. They were in sin. And God was right in judging them. Now, God never blesses that which is wrong. This makes it very clear. And this is made evident when we contrast Ezekiel with Jeremiah. And I want you to notice this again because I consider this rather important. Jeremiah reveals the heart of God. God does not want to judge, as he said in Isaiah. Judgment is a strange work. He'd rather save. That's his business. He's not willing that any should perish. And he is very much involved with the human race. The great statement that you have in the Gospel of John is, the Word became flesh. And he came down here among us. And that reveals that he has a concern for us, and he loves us. Now, it broke his heart when Jerusalem was destroyed. And Jeremiah, as he stood weeping over that city, well, no wonder they thought the Lord Jesus was Jeremiah, because he too wept over the city. Now, in Ezekiel, we have something altogether different. To tell the truth, when Jerusalem was destroyed, that very time the wife of Ezekiel died, and God forbade him to mourn or to sorrow for her. He was to act like nothing had happened. Now, God was weeping over Jerusalem, but God did not mourn for them. God was not repenting of what he had done. What you have is God, with tears in his eyes, punished Jerusalem and destroyed the city. And he was doing that which was in keeping with his character, that which was right, and it's right because what God does is right, my friend. Paul asked, is there unrighteousness with God? Of course there's not. Whatever God does is right. And so his glory is manifested in judgment. His grace is manifested in redemption. And if he hadn't provided a redemption for us, there'd be no salvation from man whatsoever. Now, in chapters 38 and 39, we believe that that kingdom in the north is going to be Russia, and certainly is today. Now, when Russia is destroyed in the future, the question is, why will God destroy Russia? All right, let's look and find out. I'm going to read two verses. In Ezekiel, the 38th chapter, in verse 
16. Now, will you listen to this? And thou shalt come up against my people of Israel like a cloud to cover the land. It shall be in the latter days. And I will bring thee against my land that the nations may know me when I shall be sanctified in thee, O Gog, before their eyes. Well, what's God going to do? Going to destroy them. Well, you mean to tell me that God would do that? He sure will. And only the liberal has problem with the Lord Jesus cursing a fig tree and also of destroying a few pigs. I don't know why that a liberal, I was in a conference and there was a liberal there, and man, he just wept because Jesus destroyed those pigs. And every morning he had bacon for breakfast. And I tell you, he was like the walrus and the carpenter, just weeping because of all the sand on the seashore, but they were busy eating oysters as fast as they could. I'm not impressed by these people today that get upset with God because he judges. I have a notion God's a little upset with them. Now, let me read another verse, 39 and verses 6 and 7. I'll read two here. And I will send a fire on Magog, and among those who dwell securely in the coastlands, and they shall know that I am the Lord. So will I make my holy name known in the midst of my people, Israel. And I will not let them pollute my holy name anymore, and the nation shall know that I am the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. Now, the question is, where is God today? Why doesn't he do something? Why doesn't he move today? A few years ago, a group of Christians appeared in Moscow at the American embassy, and they appealed, actually weeping. And this was shown on TV, asking that they be permitted to leave Russia. And they were being persecuted. And our country did nothing. I haven't quite understood why we interfere down in Vietnam, and why in Russia, Czechoslovakia, things are just as bad, and we fold our arms. I don't know why, when you move from east to west, things change like that. But they do, my friend. May I say to you that the Russian soldiers came and took those people away. I have waited again and again to hear the press say what happened to them, but they're not about to say what happened to them. May I say to you that the Soviet authorities were never dealt with, and that nation has been guilty of more anti-Semitism than any other nation over a period of years. And injustice is in the world. And the question today is, why does not God move? And there's no respect for God throughout the world today. They think he's just a jolly old man that shuts his eyes to the injustice in the world. My friend, I want to say this to you. Why doesn't God move? He is going to move. He'll vindicate his glory. He'll not do it in a vindictive and revengeful and petulant manner, but he's going to do that. And when he does, there will be a respect and reverence for God in this world, and that's the only thing that'll make a little man bow before him. There's no respect of God today. Let me turn to two verses of Scripture here. The first one is in Romans 2, 3. And here he says, And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things, and thou doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Well, you're not going to escape. You're not getting by with it. And man today thinks he is, but he's not. And then again in Hebrews 2, 3, How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard it? I have a sermon on that verse, and the title of it is this, A Question That God Cannot Answer. How shall you escape if you neglect so great a salvation? Well, you can't escape. There's no answer to it at all. Now, let me use an old-fashioned square expression 
that just gags the liberal preachers. And unfortunately, it has the same effect on some so-called evangelicals who are tempting to make a name for themselves and sort of win over the world. They want to make the world a better place for people to go to hell in. And even some fundamentalists today are so busy trying to straighten out other fundamentalists that they have no time to deal with this subject. And here it is. My friend, hell is an awful reality. And you can interpret it as you will. It's a place where a holy God places those who are in rebellion against him. And those who sin with impunity, and those who blaspheme his holy name at will, those who live like animals in the name of freedom, but they are indulging in gross immorality. My friends, God's holy name is going to be vindicated. And how will it be vindicated? In love? Why, he's demonstrating his love today in giving his Son. Those of us who name his name need to learn a lesson. We need to learn that you can't trifle with him. You can't get familiar with him. You can't live as you please and then buddy-buddy up to him. Our God is holy. And we need also to learn we can't presume upon him. We can't sin and get by with it. If you can, then God is no better than you are. My friend, I'm a creature, and I'm a sinner. And I am what I am now by the grace of God. And man is but a creature. God's will will prevail. And our proper position is to bow before him. And my only liberty today is in the will of God. He remembers we are dust. But I can say with Paul, I obtain mercy. My friend, if you defy him, he'll trample you under his feet. But he'll love you, and he loves you. And the day is coming when they will not offend in my holy mountain, says the Lord. He's running everything, friends, not man. Now, friends, we come to our last study in the book of Ezekiel, and we begin at the 40th chapter. You have the description of the millennial temple in chapters 40 through 42. Then you have the worship of the millennial temple in chapters 43 to 46, and then the vision concerning the land in 47 through 48. Now, I'm not going into a great deal of detail, as you can well understand. Now, this is a picture of a millennial temple. I expect to see it. I expect maybe to go in it. But I don't intend to worship there, and I don't think I'll be engaged in it. It'll be here on this earth. And I'm going to be in a place where if you went over to the 21st chapter of Revelation, is where you'd have to go, you would find there a description of the New Jerusalem. That's going to be the address of the believer. And if you want to give anybody your address for eternity, I don't know what street you'll be on, don't know what street I'll be on, but I hope I'm on Glory Boulevard up there somewhere. We'll be in the New Jerusalem. We at least know the city. There's a description given of it, and one of the things that's said about it And I saw no temple therein for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb of the temple of it. So we're going to be in a place where there won't be a temple. We won't need one. The earth will have one for the millennium at least. And so we have a picture of the millennial temple, but we're going to be up there where we don't have a temple. And I rather like that because, very candidly, I never have gone in much for ritual. I never felt like it added a great deal to me. I personally think preliminaries are too long in most churches. But, of course, it'd be very easy to say, well, you're senile now, retired preacher, and naturally you would say that. Maybe naturally I would, but I say it just the same. And therefore, I'm going to be delighted to be up there where the Lord God and the Lamb are the temple of it, and we'll be with them. I can't even conceive of how wonderful that's going to be. 
So in view of that, I don't get too excited over this millennial temple, but maybe we should be excited over it. Now I'm going to begin reading at chapter 40. Now we've seen progress and development in the book of Ezekiel. After the enemy is put down, we are going to find that they're going to enter a millennium and there'll be a temple here on this earth. And by the way, we're still talking about the earth, and that means Israel and the Gentile nations that will be saved. Church is up yonder with him in the New Jerusalem. Now, verse 1, chapter 40. In the five and twentieth year of our captivity, in the beginning of the year, the tenth day of the month, in the fourteenth year after the city was smitten, on the very same day the hand of the Lord was upon me and brought me there. Now, Jerusalem is destroyed. <laughs> Temples burnt. Yet this man Ezekiel is shown now the temple that will be there in the kingdom. Verse 2, "...in the visions of God brought he me into the land of Israel, and set me upon a very high mountain, on which was a structure like a city on the south. And he brought me there, and behold, there was a man whose appearance was like the appearance of bronze." with a line of flax in his hand and a measuring reed, and he stood in the gate. Now, every time that you find a man with a measuring rod, generally an angel, and that's who it is here, it means God is getting ready to move again in dealing with his earthly people here upon this earth. That seems to be the significance of it. You have it in the book of Revelation. And we're going to find it again as we move on into the minor prophets. Now, I think that's the meaning of it. Now, we're told here in verse 4, chapter 40, "...and the man said unto me, Son of man, behold with thine eyes, and hear with thine ears. Set thine heart upon all that I'll show thee, for to the intent that I might show them unto thee art thou brought here. Declare all that thou seest." to the house of Israel. Now, he was brought, I think, literally to Jerusalem. And he was shown the vision of the millennial temple that's going to be there in the future. Now, this vision of the millennial temple begins here with verse 5. And you have here a great deal of detailed information. Now, I'm not interested, very candidly, in going into that. I will read verse 5. And behold, a wall on the outside of the house round about, and in the man's hand a measuring reed of six cubits long with a cubit of a handbreadth. So he measured the breadth of the building, one reed, and the height, one reed. Now, we have here the millennial temple, and apparently its environs are given to us. And it will probably be a thing of great beauty. Now, here in these two chapters, we have the detail of it given. Here is something that's quite interesting. He begins now to even give directions. Verse 35 of this chapter, He brought me to the north gate and measured it according to these measures. Verse 39, And in the porch of the gate were two tables on this side and two tables on that side on which to slay the burnt offering and the sin offering and the trespass offering. Now, apparently the sacrifices are going to be repeated. And when we get to the worship in a few moments, we'll see that. But now we see here they will have the sacrifice. Verse 41, four tables were on this side and four tables on that side by the side of the gate. Eight tables upon which they slew their sacrifices. Now, there are going to be sacrifices in the millennium. Well, we'll have a word to say about that in just a moment. Now, they're not only going to have sacrifices, they're going to have music in the temple. Singers, verse 44. And outside the inner gate were the chambers of the singers in the inner court, which was at the side of the north gate, and their prospect was toward the south one at the side of the east gate, having the prospect toward the north. Now, he goes on mentioning again, "...and the altar that was before the house." Verse 47, 
so that our attention is called again and again here to the fact that there is going to be an altar for sacrifice. Now, I may be wrong in this, but in the Holy City Hotel in Jerusalem, over on the Israel side primarily, not in the old city, they have there more or less of a miniature of the city. It's actually bigger than what we think of as a table model. It covers quite an area there. And it gives you some idea about how Jerusalem looked in the days of Herod, which means the days of Christ. There's the temple there, by the way. Now, the thing that interests me about that temple is best I can tell, and I have slides of it, and I have put them on the screen, and look, I see no altar for sacrifice. They have left that out. A little embarrassed by it, by the way. The Orthodox Jews are a little embarrassed. And, of course, the liberal Jew would want to get rid of it altogether. But here in the Millennial Temple, at this particular place, we find here the altar. And that's for sacrifice. Now, I'll leave that for a moment. I'll come back to it. Chapter 41, verse 1. Afterward, he brought me to the temple and measured the posts, six cubits, and so on. And then we have something else here. Very important for us to see that as we're beginning to look at the temple, we recognize now that the thing that was absent, apparently in the last days of the Temple of Solomon, was the Shekinah glory, the presence of God. And we find when we get to chapter 43 that the glory returns to the temple. Now, when you get over here for the temple worship, why, the one that they're to worship now is in the temple. And I think it'll probably be none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 1 in chapter 43, Afterward he brought me to the gate, even the gate that looketh toward the east. And behold, the glory of the God of Israel came from the way of the east. His voice was like the noise of many waters, and the earth shined with his glory." I think that's none other than the person of Christ now, and the Shekinah glory is with him. When he came here 1,900 years ago, the glory was not there. Verse 4, "...and the glory of the Lord came into the house by the way of the gate, whose prospect is toward the east." Now, apparently comes in in that direction there. We'll have a word to say about that. Now, here, relative to the worship, in verse 19... Now, notice this. We're now dealing with the worship of this house. And thou shalt give to the priests, the Levites, who are of the seed of Zadok, who approach unto me to minister unto me, saith the Lord God, a young bullock for a sin offering. Now, we have here the offerings. And the fact of the matter is, the Passover, apparently, is to be brought back. Over in chapter 45, verse 21, we have here in the first month and the 14th day of the month, ye shall have the Passover. Now, the Passover definitely refers to Christ. We're told today Christ, our Passover, is offered to us. Now, we come to a major question, and that question is, after all of the sacrifices were fulfilled in Christ, why are they restored again during the millennium? Now, that's a good question. I went, as I've told you before, to a seminary that was amillennial. That is, they did not believe there'd be a millennium, and they spiritualized, oh boy, do they spiritualize this section. And one of the lessons that we had to learn was 27 objections to the premillennial viewpoint. And there was a time when I knew all of them. I had to, to pass the course. And the professor was nice enough because he let certain ones who made a certain grade did not have to take the final exam. And I did not have to take the final exam. And I say that so no one can come along and say, well, you just didn't get the message. Well, I made the professor think I got the message. And of the 27 objections, two men in the class, another fellow myself, went up to him and we said to him, Doctor, you have two sound objections against premillennialism. But 25 are just objections against the cults that we today do not believe, but we object to also, and all that type of thing. So that 
the two objections that we would agree with him on, one of them was that the premillennialist takes the Bible literally. And I'll admit that that presents a problem at times. And you do have to use, I think, a little consecrated common sense at times. And I think the Bible, though, makes it clear whether we're being given a symbol or whether it's to be taken literally. But even when it's a symbol, it's a symbol of reality. And that's something I think very important. Now, the other objection that he had, why would the sacrifices be restored? And I'll admit that poses an objection. Personally, it's no objection to me. I think the sacrifices are going to look back to the coming of Christ and his death upon the cross in the millennium, just as the Lord's Supper today looks back upon it. And somebody's going to say, why this literalism? Well, I think that the human family has a great deal of difficulty learning lessons. I find I do. And that's the reason I believe the literal blood of Christ is going to be in heaven, simply because of the fact that there's a reason for it. It's going to be revealed to us the horrible pit out of which we would dig. Being saved from sin and from hell for heaven, friends, that's a pretty big project, and only God could undertake that. And that will remind us. And the restoration of the sacrifices are going to reveal to these people how they were redeemed also. Now, that would be my answer. Now, we come in chapter 44 to something that's quite remarkable, and maybe here we can get a little light on something. Then he brought me back the way of the gate of the outer sanctuary, which looketh toward the east, and it was shut. Now, the gate toward the east is shut. Then said the Lord unto me, This gate shall be shut, it shall not be opened, and no man shall enter in by it, because the Lord, the God of Israel, hath entered in by it, therefore it shall be shut. It is for the prince, the prince shall sit in it, to eat bread before the Lord. He shall enter by the way of the porch of their gate, and shall go out by way of the same. Now, this has led to a very peculiar statement that many of our premillennial brethren make that the eastern gate of the city, and it's there today, and it's walled up, and that it won't be opened until the Messiah comes, and then he's coming in that gate. Well, there are several objections to that. And when you come here to Ezekiel and study it, you find out two things. To begin with, the prince that's coming is not the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a prince that A great many feel it's David. Others think it's not David, but they all agree that it's not the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, somebody says, how do you know? Because he offers a sacrifice and worships God. Well, he is God. And he never offered a sacrifice when he was here in the flesh before. And I'm of the opinion he won't be around offering a sacrifice in that day either, my friend. Not be necessary. He will still be able to say, which of you convicteth me of sin? And so that I don't think that he's the prince here. I have a notion. I personally think it's David. Now, I know that there are many fine men that feel like it's a prince in the line of David that'll be there and that he's the one. Now, if you accept that viewpoint, you are going to be in good company. A lot of fine men. But now, if you want to be right, you know who you want to go with, don't you? Now, may I then add this other, and now very seriously. The gate that he's talking about here, obviously, is not the gate of the city. It's the gate of the temple. Well, somebody says it's not there. That's the whole point. You see, the temple has to be built first before that can take place. And it's not that gate that's there today that's walled up and hasn't anything in the world to do with it. Somebody says, well, don't you think he may come in that gate? Well, that prince is coming, probably will come in that gate. I see no objection to it. But that wall could be torn down then and another gate put up. You must remember, that's not the wall that was there when even the Lord Jesus was there. And it certainly was not the wall that Ezekiel saw, because that has long since been destroyed. Now, We come here to something else. We've seen the worship in the temple. Now you have a picture of the land. And in chapter 47, we have something here that I think is probably one of the most remarkable 
passages of Scripture, and we are only going to have a word to say about it. Verse 1, chapter 47, "...afterward he brought me again unto the door of the house, and behold, waters issued out from under the threshold of the house eastward." That is now from the altar, from the throne, if you please. And this is where all blessings originate. They originate at the altar. Everything that comes to us by way of blessings, friends, comes through the death of Christ for you and me upon the cross. Now, the water goes out, and at first we are told that it is only ankle deep, if you'll notice there. And we are told, "...then brought me out of the way of the gate northward, and led me to the way outside the gate. And behold, there ran waters on the right side." And the waters, verse 3, were ankle deep. And I feel like ankle deep is for service, if you please. And the source of the water is in the redemption of Christ. All service is anchored there. And when I say ankle deep, I should say the walk of the believer. Now, when it's up to the loins, you gird up your loins for service. So that's the service, so that the walk of the believer rests upon the redemption we have in Christ. The loins here represent service. But I think the interpretation of it is applicable to that day, for I think that they will have an eternal spring of water that will be coming out of that altar in that day that's going to bring blessing to that land. My friends, they need that water in that land today. Then it goes on down, and we find there's going to be enough to swim in. That's the fullness of the Spirit. That speaks of the day when God will pour out His Spirit upon those people. He is not today. He indwells believers today. And then it gets down to where, verse 7, there are many trees. That's fruit will be in our lives. What a picture. Now, the book of Ezekiel closes with this picture of the city, the millennial city, and the land during the millennium. All the curse is removed. What a picture we have here. So until next time, may God richly bless you, my beloved.